speaker series. Each year we invite guests in and uh, around the country and outside of our country, a very special guest here with us today, Dr. Anne rifkin Graboy, to talk to us about things relevant to early childhood. So Dr. Anne rifkin Graboy is uh, coming to us via uh, Singapore, actually. So we're welcoming her and saying good morning. Um, she is a senior research scientist with the National Institute of Education. Uh, she is the head of infancy and early childhood research, the Center for Research Child Development, and faculty with the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Um, another claim to fame, Dr. Rifkin Gaboy, what work was uh, featured in the Netflix docuseries Babies. I know a lot of us are familiar with. Um, Dr. Rifkin Gaboy's research uh, expands across a lot of different topic areas. And I'm actually just going to read from some of the questions she poised on her research page. So what accounts for the differences in the way we remember, organize, and perceive information? How do differences in early caregiving affect these functions? Why do caregiver practices differ from one family to the next? And what can we do to help families and children in need of support? So today, Dr. Rifkin Gaboy will be sharing new perspectives on childhood adversity with a focus on implications for developing memory. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and stop sharing here so we can go ahead and hand it over. Emily, thank you so much um, for that really nice introduction. And also Robert, thank you. Robert is an old friend. Thank you um, for introducing me to, to this group. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start screen sharing if, and I also see some other um, some other faces to say hi to. Uh, I'm going to start screen sharing if you have any questions or if something is wrong with Zoom, just speak up and and let me know. Uh, when I start sharing, I probably won't be able to see your faces anymore because I'm going to hide the panel so that it doesn't get in the way of your view. So just interrupt me. I love being interrupted. Um, and obviously, uh, feel free to, to call me Anne and to ask anything, um, either for clarification or if you disagree. I've tried to keep the talk not the full hour so that there's lots of room for discussion. Um, I was saying before that my background actually is not in education, although I do work with a lot of teachers and education policy makers. Um, and so I'm also really excited to learn from all of you and to think about whether or not some of this resonates with you and uh, has some real world implications. So let me go ahead and share. Um, and let's see. Do, 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 do going to take a second to switch over side to the other. Um, you'll see my speaker notes for a second. Okay. Is everyone able to see my screen? It's perfect. Yes. Great. Thanks, Robert. Um, okay. So as Emily mentioned, uh, today we're going to talk about new perspectives on childhood adversity with implications for developing memory. Uh, Emily also mentioned uh, that I'm coming to you from Singapore. And so to make this feel a little bit more personal, but also so that you can understand the context of where a lot of this research that I'm going to be talking about has been done, I thought I would share a few um, a few facts about Singapore. The first of which is that it's morning here. So it's 6.30 a.m. So good morning from Singapore. Um, I am actually speaking to you from, from uh, a very small country in the uh, in Southeast Asia. So if you're not familiar with it, it's actually right off the southern tip of Malaysia, about 60 to 90 miles north of the equator. Um, this here is Indonesia, and this is Malaysia. And so Singapore is this little dot sometimes referred to as the red dot uh, south of that. It's a young country, which I think makes it interesting in many ways, including that the current generation of um, parents 
may be quite a bit different than, or their life experience might be quite a bit different than the pioneer generation um, who were developing uh, the, the country. And children here often spend a lot of time with extended caregivers, including grandparents, and will even um, often shift back and forth between homes. It's also a very densely populated country. So if you look on Wikipedia, it's going to um, give you the square kilometers or square miles, but the majority of the population lives in the main island, not these little outer islands. Um, and the, the number of people living here is close to 5.7 million people, all living within 120 miles of coastline. You can imagine, for example, during um, pandemic, restrictions that uh, most of us felt a little bit stir crazy for a few years not being able to leave more than about um, 20 miles from our our homes or at least I did. Um, there are three major ethnicities that make up the majority of the inhabitants of Singapore, uh, Chinese, Malay, and Indian. Um, you can see here an example of two of my favorite uh, ethnic Chinese and ethnic Indian uh, families. Um, these are two of my lab managers, Litwi and Shamini, who have contributed quite a bit to a lot of this research and their wonderful sons. Um, and in school here, everyone learns in English along with a mother tongue language and that quote unquote mother tongue language is really assigned to children based on the language that's closest to their father's um, pater father's ethnicity. Uh, school is um, also preschool, at least the majority of the population is in some form of preschool or kindergarten certainly by the time of five or six and primary one um, starts when there's uh, about seven, six to seven. Singapore is also very wealthy. It's one of the um, major homes of millionaires and highly educated. Uh, it has great statistics and you can just Google Singapore stat and kind of find whatever you want. Um, it's made publicly available here. I know this graph is a little bit small, but it's really showing you that um, 90 some percent of the population, uh, the younger at the younger ages, um, has actually had some type of higher education. That doesn't necessarily mean university, but it means post-secondary um, training, either a diploma, IT, could be university, um, things along those lines. But it also has a relatively high Gini coefficient. So remember this number here, the higher it is, the more um, disparity between rich and poor. I moved to Singapore uh, towards the end of 2009. Um, I'm now with the National Institute of Education, part of Nanyang. But when I first moved here, uh, I was working at ASTAR um, in the Singapore Institute for Clinical Sciences as part of a cohort study called GUSTO. Uh, and when I came, one of the big questions that I had uh, was whether or not everyday differences in exposure to adversity could lead to what I thought of then as the deterioration of brain functioning, especially in areas supporting memory and stress regulation. So some of you have maybe heard, um, you know, phrases like toxic stress or, um, or, uh, uh, neurodegeneration in response to, to stress. And that was really what I was wondering about. Would, would kind of everyday exposures to stress lead to problems in memory and lead to problems in the underlying structures supporting memory? And it, so this was really from kind of a deficit model. And there were lots of reasons that I was thinking about that. There had been a lot of research 
um, showing associations between mental health conditions that we think of as being associated with stress or negative experience, things like post-traumatic stress disorder and um, chronic depression, other anxiety disorders, uh, is associating with smaller regions of the brain, so smaller regions um, in particular of this one area called the hippocampus, which supports memory and stress regulation, and also these mental health conditions associating with poor memory, poor planning, um, and some emotion regulation problems. And on top of that, on top of this work that was showing that people who were likely to have very stressful experiences, either lots of chronic stress or high levels of acute stress and having these um, problems with neurofunctioning, that also in the animal world, uh, just kind of more simple everyday stressors, changing the caregiving environment of young pups, making their moms more stressed out so they had less capacity to care for the pups, that those kind of things were also impacting um, receptors and the functioning of cells, how, um, how many connections the cells made in these same brain regions, and that um, they were being linked to kind of cognitive deficits in many cases, or differences, at least in the animal's functioning as well. So for those of you interested, and I know there are a few people here who are really interested in, in biology, and so for you, um, excuse the kind of overview, for those of you who are interested in biology but maybe don't know quite as much, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the mechanism, and for those of you who really just hate biology and neuroscience, just give me about a minute and it'll all be over and we'll get back into um, with a more uh, straightforward psychology. So. Um, the mechanism, the proposed mechanism behind a lot of these associations between stress and adversity and um, difficulties in functioning really was based on this idea that in response to adversity, um, when we can, we try to manage adversity by changing our behavior or um, if that's not possible, our sympathetic nervous system might kick in, our heartbeat might um, you know, get raised our adrenaline so that we can run faster. But when that doesn't work also, we need an extra boost. And that extra boost can come from hormones like cortisol that are going to release energy into our body so that we can do more things. And so when these behavioral solutions and these quick term solutions with the sympathetic nervous system don't work in response to adversity, our HPA axis kicks in. So our hypothalamus signals our pituitaries, which signal our adrenals to um, emit cortisol. And then that feeds back on to areas of the brain that are important for memory and stress regulation and also um, emotion. And the area that we're going to really focus on today is the hippocampus. Um, I don't know if there are any Mandarin speakers here, but if there are, that would be Hai Ma, oh, excuse my pronunciation, which means seahorse because of its seahorse-like shape. Um, and we can see over here, kind of it's somewhat deep uh, towards the middle of the brain um, and interacts a lot with areas more towards the front that are important for uh, planning and organizing information and regulation. So the idea here is that when you have this stress response, not only does the cortisol go out into your body, but it also goes back to these brain re regions, especially ones like the hippocampus that are rich in receptors for it. And in response to that, you might change some of your behavior, you might change what you focus on. And when things are working well, you're also gonna get a signal to the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal, the HPA axis, that things are okay now. The cortisol is out there, you can turn off. But the idea behind a lot of this research was that when adversity is really prolonged or really intense, that that whole pathway, that negative feedback might get disrupted. And so the brain may no longer be getting a signal to stop producing 
these stress hormones. And so that may continue over time. And over time, what that might do is actually lead to um, what I think traditionally was thought of as deterioration in these, in these regions. And so with that kind of background, it seemed to me very reasonable to say, hmm, would this same process happen even when the stress is not war or rape or trauma or long-term depression? Could we see a similar pathway, maybe less extreme outcomes, but a similar thing happen when young children are exposed to everyday kinds of stressors. And so for me, I thought a good place to start would be to focus on sensitive to insensitive care. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about why uh, I thought that that was a good candidate, because certainly there are other candidates as, as well. So sensitive care um, refers to a caregiver's ability to notice an infant's signals or a child's signals and appropriately respond to them in a timely manner. And I'll show you a little clip of a mom doing this from the gusto sample. A lot of times when people think about um, sensitivity, they think about response to infant signals of distress, but we can also, as you'll see here, think of them in terms of signals for exploration. And these are going to be really subtle. So I'll tell you what to look out for. You're going to see, um, you're going to look for the mom looking to see what the infant is interested in, following the infant's lead, making sure the infant is supported, and helping the infant reach things that she's interested in that are really um, a bit out of her way. And given her age of six months, she can't get to herself. So you can see the mom's really focused checking in on the baby. Okay, the baby gets tired of that and the mom sees that the baby is looking for something else to do. So she helps her, she gets her that ball. She's again checking in to see if the infant's interested. She's going to help the infant in a second uh, get over to the ball. She's talking with her. There's communication. You can see um, that she's really interested in supporting and literally having the baby's back. And when the baby is tired with the book, she introduces her to something new. This kind of caregiving um, is somewhat equivalent to a combination of, if any of you are familiar with the class system, things like um, the emotional climate and also instructional support, I think both come out of um, this, this same theoretical model uh, that values the importance of sensitivity and sensitive care. Now, sensitive care, when I said I was looking for something that I thought would be kind of a that many people would have experienced variation in this. It's important to know that insensitive care is common and varies with socioeconomic risk. So I'm doing a little bit of inference here in this next graph that I'm gonna show you, but we can make a pretty good guess that even in low risk groups and community samples, often uh, middle class, um, that actually the percentage of people who are likely to have received sensitive care is only about 50%, maybe a little bit more, but that a lot of people have probably experienced um, at least not consistent sensitive care with a decent amount of rejection or things that are frightening or inconsistency. And on top of that, this proportion, this green part of people who have probably majority experienced sensitive care is even less in higher risk groups, and that includes impoverished groups. And we know 
that um, as sensitive as uh, SES decreases, sensitive care also decreases. So sensitive care is less common in lower SES groups. And the, uh, and the predominant way of thinking about that is that um, when people are less financially um, well off and have less education, they may have less bandwidth, their lives may be more stressful. And so they have less bandwidth to um, be able to care for their children. This is not something about them as individuals, as finances improve, as there's less stress in their life, they may have more capacity to, to care. So again, thinking about this as a product of, um, of stress and associating with stressful environments. And finally, um, in terms of that mechanism, it seemed like insensitive care might trigger some of the same responses. So for all of us, right, um, I think if I remember, I lived in California uh, for quite a while, and I think that um, we might all have been familiar with at least the idea that we could run into something like a mountain lion um, running around the hills. For anything that we encounter, even as adults, we need to determine whether or not it's a challenge that we can just simply alter our behavior, thoughts, and emotions to achieve our goal, or whether or not it's something that's really stressful and we need to kick in our physiology. But um, that may not be a conscious decision, but we're always kind of making those, those choices. For infants and young children, those that trade-off is probably happening even more frequently. Because if you think about it, when you're really young, there's almost nothing that you can do entirely on your own. Everything is a little bit challenging, right? So there's not just real threats in the environment, but there's also the challenge of being fed, of being safe, of being comforted, of um, having the appropriate amount of thermoregulation, you know, being not too hot, not too cold. And there's also the challenge of trying to learn new things, which some of that you can do on your own, but in a lot of cases, you're going to need your parents' support either to manage something truly stressful, to help you with everyday um, basic functions, or to help you learn and explore and get things that are kind of out of reach, both literally and developmentally. So in early childhood and infancy, on top of this um, basic idea that we could you know, decide if we need to alter our behavior and thoughts, probably one of the best ways to reach your goal is to signal for help. Those can be you know, small signals or big signals. And then if you're lucky, you receive some support and then that kind of alters the situation and you get to your goal. But if insensitive care is somewhat frightening, then we could easily expect that our physiology um, kicks in and some of those same pathways that may alter the hippocampus uh, kick in. If insensitive behavior limits the child's opportunity to even try to engage in a behavioral strategy, that also um, puts a block on this kind of lower cost behavioral solution. And if insensitive care actually is such that children learn that if they signal for help, they are not going to receive support, then that too would alter their ability to get to that goal. So in all of these cases, all of these forms of insensitivity, we might expect some type of cortisol response. And if this is consistent over time, it might we might be able to think about it as kind of a low level everyday stressor that could lead to similar outcomes, or at least that's, um, that's what, what I was thinking about about 10 years ago. Um, so let's get into some of the data then. Um, does early adversity, uh, especially with insensitive care, affect relations to early brain development and in specific hippocampal functioning? Emily was kind enough to say that some of this work had been featured on babies, um, and it has been. And I will just say that I think that um, the director of the docu-series probably 
presented this work in a more enjoyable way than I'm presenting it to you today. So if you are interested, I would go check out episode one, Love, that kind of um, talks about uh, this first study I'm going to tell you about, but also just a little bit of a plug for the docuseries if you're interested in infant development. I think it's a kind of fun um, overview of lots of people's uh, research. So what we did um, to get at this question of whether or not insensitive care associates, this should really say associates with hippocampal volume, was to take children, take babies who had already had neuroimaging scans at birth, so before they had really had much exposure to insensitive versus sensitive care uh, because they had just been born. They'd had at most you know, a week of exposure to caregiving. Um, to take those kids where we knew a baseline of what their brains looked like and then scan them again at six months of age and see if, as expected, these everyday differences in sensitivity that we had observed in, in the lab, if those predicted hippocampal volume, even after we controlled for lots of other things. And as you're going to see in this next slide, we did. We got associations. So that was really cool. Um, this idea that everyday kind of stress might influence the hippocampal volume was supported. However, if you're kind of paying attention here, you may see that these lines, and it's not just you, you're, you're reading this correctly, that these lines are inverted from what we might have expected. So um, this is really saying that the less sensitive care that you've received, the bigger your hippocampal volume, the bigger this region that supports stress and memory is. And that seemed, there, there was, when we got this result, there was some idea in the literature of um, what it might mean, but it also seemed a little bit counterintuitive. And it really made me think more and more about why do we even learn, right? So we learn, of course, for things like, um, in order to function in school and to be, you know, able to be functional members of adult society. But probably, even though things like learning are important to school and adulthood, that really can't be the, the only reason formal education um, didn't even begin until the 1600s and humanity was learning before that. Um, Lots of people around the world, unfortunately, don't go to school, but certainly they still learn. And even in countries like Singapore, most of children's lives occur outside of school. So why really would, um, would why, why do we learn? And perhaps we learn so that we can survive, so that we can live in our expectable environments. So think about this this way. You have a really, really nice living condition. It's probably not that important to learn to remember where the best hiding space is, you know, how many carrots they're going to be, because there's always going to be more, more carrots, whether or not there were predictors of good weather, bad weather, what time it gets dark, because life is pretty good. So perhaps it's not so important in this environment to prioritize the development of memory and things that support memory. But if you live in an environment like this, if you're born into an environment like this, unless you're lucky enough to have someone who really is watching out for you all of the time and doing all of that memory work for you, it's probably going to be pretty important to, of all of the brain regions that you could focus on building early in life, that memory um, is one of the memory and uh, regulation, because you need to know where it is that um, you can hide. You need to know what the predictors of fearful um, and threatening things are and where the best food sources are and what the quickest path is to reach them. Or... I think in more common parlance, we can think of this as the, these results pointing to this phrase of like, oh, that child, that child's hippocampus had to grow up too quickly. 
And I think we all can think about um, children and people that we've met where we say, oh, but they had to grow up too quickly. They, you know, their lives were really hard. And in fact, this is not my work. This is um, work by uh, Nim Tottenham and Guy and, other, uh, and others. But there is this idea um, in institutionalized children uh, that early adversity does lead to more adult-like brain development at a young age. So what you see here, these, um, this group is children and adolescents who were raised at home, and these are institutionalized kids. And you can see that while there's a difference between what the brain patterns look like in the home-reared kids versus adolescents, that for the institutionalized um, children, they look much more like adolescent counterparts, suggesting that they had um, experienced this accelerated development or this growing up too quickly. And what we see in this graph, which is really interesting and goes back to this idea of why we might need some accelerated development in certain circumstances, you can see that in terms of um, this one uh, parameter of mental health, that although all of the kids who are institutionalized are looking worse than the comparison group, amongst those who are institutionalized, the ones who actually showed this accelerated um, pattern were actually doing better than the ones who hadn't. So there may be some adaptive function. And around the time and since the time we published those results, there have actually been other, um, other studies and then similar studies that are also suggesting that this uh, accelerated development, that more um, difficult early life experiences may relate to larger hippocampal volume. So if we see it in the biology, shouldn't we also see it with early cognitive development. So one of the questions that um, colleagues and I asked was whether or not sensitive caregiving would also predict infant memory. So you guys can follow along. We gave, because infants can't tell you what they remember, we used an eye tracking task and we gave uh, children, um, we, we showed babies um, toy images superimposed on screens. And then we would pick one of the background scenes that we had superimposed the images on and show all three of the images. And we looked to see, did they look more preferentially at one of them? And perhaps you guys will all know that that in this particular case um, is the image that had been superimposed on that, uh, on that background scene. And what we found was that here too, the children who had experienced insensitive care were actually showing better memory. They were um, showing more likelihood of looking to the correctly matched object than their counterparts, reinforcing this idea of accelerated development in the cognitive domain. Um, another piece of work that suggests that there is a link between insensitive care and memory um, has to do with responses to threatening uh, stimuli. So I'm going to show you um, a task that we did. You can see here, there's a cute little boy and an experimenter, and the experimenter is showing him a pretend lizard. This little guy is curious from the start. He is, um, he's happy to touch the lizard. The experimenter actually makes the lizard jump. That's part of the task. This guy isn't phased. He keeps looking in. He keeps checking it out. Not all kids reacted this way. So here we see another little boy with another experimenter. Um, you can see that this guy this cute guy has absolutely no interest in um, this lizard whatsoever. He's pretty frightened of it. He wants to actually get as far away as possible from it. Despite the fact that just as, as this experimenter Jeremy did, she keeps saying it's a nice lizard. It won't hurt you. It won't bother you. See, I can, I can touch it or you can touch it. And ultimately, in fact, and this is my favorite, he has her touch it, and then he goes ahead and tries. What Stella, um, who led this work, uh, found was that actually early sensitive care had nothing to do with whether or not the children would touch the lizard in the first place. What it had to do with was 
how much they startled over time. So the kids who had been exposed to sensitive care, the more times, the more trials, the more experience they had with the experimenter saying, no, 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 it's a nice, uh, nice lizard, you can touch it, it won't hurt you, that they started looking less afraid. Whereas the kids who had had um, less sensitive care, they, they continued to be afraid or even became more afraid over time, really reflecting this idea that they had learned that this was something dangerous and they were not going to let go of it. Then we also asked things like, is the relation between early life adversity and memory nuanced? Um, we thought that it might be because of other people's work. Um, this, this picture is actually of, of my son, but I just wanted to show you what the, um, some of the background literature for this question looked like. So you can, I think you're all probably well aware of this. We can understand brain activity in young children and also in, in adults by measuring their electrophysiological functioning. Um, it's supposed to give us a window into postsynaptic activity in response to stimuli. And so this is an older study where the researchers had shown uh, maltreated children and um, controlled children pictures of angry, happy, and fearful faces. And what they found, which is what you would expect if you start thinking about um, people paying attention to things that are really personally relevant to them, what they found was a greater attention, greater neural signatures of attention to an angry target amongst kids who were abused. And they didn't see that in this particular experiment with happy targets or fearful targets. And the idea there is that if you have had an experience, a history of maltreatment and abuse, that actually it's really environmentally relevant to pay lots of attention when you see someone who's angry. And that is consistent with other people's research that also has found that young children um, just learn words more easily when they're interested in the overall topic. And I suspect that that's similar, you know, that's almost like a no brainer for people in education that if you're interested in something, of course, you're going to engage in it more and learn about it more. But that can also be extended to adversity. So um, one of the experiments that, that I've done is to look at, my colleagues and I have done, is to show children pictures of animal cartoons with girls um, who looked happy or angry, and then ask them later on, show them a picture of one of the girls that they had previously seen with either the same animal that they saw before or an animal that had been paired with a different girl. Um, and we did this setup with, with angry and happy girls. And we also ran an exactly identical experiment, except that instead of happy and angry girls, there were food um, stimuli, so a non-social um, memory pairing. And what we found was that insensitive care in infancy did not relate to memory pairings for food animal associations, but it did relate to memory pairings for um, girl animal associations, for socio-emotional associations. And actually that this seemed to be, um, this relation seemed to be most obvious in girls rather than boys. More recently, and this next slide hasn't been published yet, but um, hopefully, hopefully will be. I'm working on a draft of this. We also looked um, in another study, the space study over at NIE, we looked at whether or not um, associations between insensitive care in preschool would predict similar pairings. And here we actually drilled down a little bit and said, okay, maybe there's a link between insensitive care and socio-emotional uh, memory, but might that be even more specific for memory about angry things than memory about happy things. So if you experience a lot of insensitive care, are you going to be biased to remember things that, um, that are potentially dangerous or really relevant things that you have to think about a little bit harder. So here you can see that when we looked at relations between um, insensitive care in the preschool years and people's memory for happy 
um, items, uh, happy associations, there was the, 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 there's the straight line, right? Nothing. But once again, when we looked at it in relation to angry items, things that might be especially relevant if you've had a history of insensitive care, there was a pretty strong relation and that that was specific again to girls. This is consistent with other people's research um, that has that has to do with adversity, other forms of adversity and other getting out of the infancy and preschool years. If you're interested in this kind of work, I would absolutely refer you to the work of Franken, who's I'm not sure that I'm saying his name correctly, um, and Ellis, they've done a lot of thinking and writing about what they refer to as hidden, hidden talents um, and, uh, and poverty. Um, what you see here is the stimuli from a experiment that they ran with middle schoolers, um, predominantly middle schoolers, uh, seventh and eighth graders. This is from um, a uh, American sample in, in Utah. And this is a memory updating task. So if you just look at panel D here, ignore panel B. Um, you can see that what they would do is they would show them different images. They would show them some that were kind of neutral, and then they would show them some that they thought would be relevant to either poverty or experiences um, with violence or things along those, the, that, uh, those lines. And they wanted in each trial, they would ask them at the end of each trial, how many faces have you seen? How many buses have you seen? How many bills have, have you seen? And what they found was that um, especially with relation to violence and poverty, and perhaps especially even amongst the two with violence and exposure to violence, that although the kids were doing worse when they'd had these um, more adverse experiences, although they were doing worse at remembering how many of the abstract items they'd seen, things like buses, that was really equalized when you made the stimuli, the things that you were asking them to remember relevant to their daily lives. And likewise, that same group has looked at um, studies of memory and reasoning about social dominance. And so they, um, these, this is kind of the transitive property, right? So they had one experiment where they would show people um, two pictures of male faces that slightly differed in age, and then they would ask them which one is older. But they would also show them um, in a ident almost identical experiment, pictures of people who um, were one was more dominant to the other. And in the memory phase, they would ask them who wins. And although there were no effects on the inference part, in terms of memory, what's really interesting again here is that if you think about um, neighborhood violence, exposure to neighborhood violence, this is actually Dutch uh, adults. Um, while you saw that it took more trials in the, um, in the neutral and the age-related conditions. So they needed to see these pairings more to remember who was older, the more exposed to violence they were. When it had to do with social dominance, something that might be really relevant when you're exposed to, to um, violence, those effects went away. And in some cases, actually, um, if the current involvement in violence, the, the people who were exposed to more of it actually um, outperformed uh, their peers on memory for those social relations. Um, so what we can take away from this is that there is evidence that forms of adversity shape hippocampal development and memory. However, I should tell you, and I didn't get into all of this, that the results are not always consistent and it's possible, you know, it's always possible that that could just be because some of them were chance or file drawer problems, but it could also be that what really matters is, um, in terms of prediction, time of exposure, how old the people were when they're assessed, and also what kind of exposure. Um, is it violence? Is it poverty? Is it insensitive care? Because those might lead to subtle differences in where the quote-unquote hidden talents lie. Um, 
I should also mention that although I didn't talk about this today, there have also been other aspects of cognition and brain development that have been observed to um, relate to adversity. Although again, there may be some inconsistency in results and some of that could have to do with whether or not people are tested in kind of sterile environments or more chaotic environments where actually people who've experienced more adversity may do a little bit better than their peers. Um, and that I think it's important to consider the implications for this in terms of mental health, social relationships, and education. So one of the things that I increasingly wonder about is how can knowledge about adversity's impact on development be used to um, better children's educational and also their home uh, experiences. Again, I, I mentioned that this group, um, Frankenhaus and Ellis, have done a lot of thinking about that. They have some suggestions. So one idea that they have is that in terms of content, when you're trying to teach people rather than using these neutral um, examples, that perhaps it's better to use ones that might be socially relevant for uh, adversity. And then based on some of the other um, findings uh, in other cognitive domains, they've also suggested that uh, if we wanted to normalize the, the playing field or help people um, who have had more adverse backgrounds, actually having, you know, less sterile touching and uh, teaching environments, environments where there's more information coming at you at different times may actually um, in some ways be helpful. Um, and to allow for things like movement um, and even some uncertainty. So I think about this a lot uh, for Singapore, and I actually have been trying to think about how we might build a testing battery that could um, better identify kids who, even though they've been exposed to adversity, still have, you know, really a lot of capacity to do well if we would just test and teach them in ways that were meaningful for them. But I also spend some time um, thinking about whether or not this is relevant to America. And I mostly think about this, um, not entirely, but mostly on my morning jogs. Because although um, my morning jogs are a wonderful time to look at um, the flora of Singapore, as well as some of the fauna. So you can see here that um, there's a, a monkey in the trees or occasionally even um, a band of otters running across the park. Those morning jogs are also the time when I listen to my US news. And when I do that, I, I really, I'm sometimes blown away by some of the kind of amazing stories I've, I've seen. So I don't know if you guys are all familiar with this. Oh, is this not gonna play? Okay, that's really unfortunate. Um, so uh, you, you may be more familiar about this than I am, but um, there was this really nice story about a teacher who had realized that um, his children were not, uh, they were afraid of math, and so he started teaching them math through raps, and that that was getting them not only perhaps um, helping their memory, but getting them more involved and motivated in school, and so then there was a whole culture that came out of this where children were creating performances, um, often about education, to to both solidify and increase their enjoyment in, in school. So sometimes when I'm listening to my news, I get to hear these really cool examples, but then I also get to hear about things like, um, you know, math books being rejected in states or um, teachers feeling like they may not be able to include certain books in their um, classroom libraries for fear of being sued. And it makes me worry or wonder, I should say, about whether or not um, some of these approaches to teaching children um, who have had more adverse backgrounds that, that while in Singapore, I wonder, should we start doing it? In the US, I wonder and perhaps worry about whether some of these things may um, ultimately further impair the learning journey. Of, of these kids.
And so I thought in the last, I talked a little bit longer than I thought I was going to, and I really apologize for that. I'm happy to stay on a little bit um, if, if others are, but I thought some of the questions that I thought might be interesting for discussion would um, be, so if it is the case that adversity benefits specific aspects of cognitive functioning at particular times in development, how could curricula and teaching be modified? What have you noticed with your students? Do you think there are any pathways there? Um, is it appropriate to have, so this is kind of an ethical question, is it appropriate to have different curricula and forms of teaching according to neighborhood demographics, individual child risk profiles, or if we see some of these accelerated development or specific um, patterns of memory that vary according to um, the child sex or gender, do we, um, is it appropriate to teach different things? Um, is it acceptable to combine approaches and testing techniques that will allow both low adversity and high adversity children to shine? So remember, it's, it's sometimes the case that if we test children in ways that, um, or teach children in ways that would work to the strengths of kids who have been, had more adverse experiences, that the kind of low adversity kids won't be seeming to be doing as comparatively well. Um, related to this whole issue is what kind of skills do we really want for adult members of society? And then finally, should we teach higher risk children strategies to increase the likelihood that they function well in lower risk environments? And if we do that, is that going to impact how they navigate their real world outside of school? So those are some things I thought we might be able to talk about um, or at least consider. And with that, I really want to thank you and I will stop screen sharing um, so that we can have at least a few minutes of discussion. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, it obviously very intriguing and thought provoking, but also the questions at the end, which um, you know, maybe I can even copy some of them into the chat because I think that you've posed some really interesting questions and it would be a great way to get a discussion started. I know that we're going, getting up on our, uh, the end of our scheduled time today, which wraps up in the next few minutes. But uh, like Anne said, I'm more than happy to stay back on the call as well. So as to allow anybody who is able to hang back the opportunity to engage in a bit more discussion. Um, that said, is there anybody who might need to hop off and wants to ask that question before they do? All right, well, does anybody want to chime in? Not so time sensitive, but any, any questions from the group? I want to quickly tell Anne that you are still sharing your screen, so we can still see. I, what you're I doing. know I'm. Okay. I'm trying to. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate it. <laughs> I um, I have lost somehow lost my. So you get to see my very messy desktop. I I can't find my um. You you see me clicking around. It's because I can't see your faces. I've somehow lost. Ah, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> If nobody else is going to ask a question, I have a question, but I want to open up the space for others before I jump in. Get us started. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and get started. So it, it relates to your final question. So as I was watching, uh, listening to the different studies and the findings, um, one of my questions um, was how does it work? Like, you know, many of us, and in, as you said, in Singapore, most young children go to a care, have a different care provider throughout the day. So it seems like there's that um, potential interaction between the type of care they receive at home versus the type of care they might receive in the program. Um, and so then thinking about those issues of the, should there be different types of curriculum? When I'm thinking about very young kids, is it more that we need to make sure that the curriculum, quote unquote curriculum, is really responsive um, and uh, nurturing um, kind of as a protective barrier against the, you know, even like what's happening in the, in the community in which the provider is situated or the child's growing up. Um, kind of before we start thinking about separating kids 
to different curriculums based on their background. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on that. It's something that I think about. So one of the one of the studies I didn't talk about it um, here, but one of the studies that I'm currently doing is uh, a community, a large community sample, where what we're really hoping if we can get the teachers involved is this intensive study of the kids' home lives, and then also to get their preschool and child care center teachers um, involved, and to see whether or not it's the case that having a match between the two environments is really important or whether you know having x number of good environments is what's important or if having consistency across is what uh, matters um one of the things so you know i think most interventions um, or prevention programs would suggest no we need to build up everyone's skills so that they can function in the kind of society that you know, we as academics, but also, you know, the workforce wants the good executive control, things like that. But um, one of the things that I wonder about, and I, I, I don't know the answer to, is if we really, really try to change um, to kind of some get rid of some of those things like fear learning and stuff like that, th does that hurt the kid when they go home, right? If that's a relevant thing that they need to be able to do at home, is it actually in any way beneficial um, to them? I don't know the answer to, to that part. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other part of your question though, is like, shouldn't we, should we just be building up all of these skills for everyone? Uh, personally, that sounds like a great idea to me, um, but I also kind of wonder just in terms of, you know, the politics of it and the parent, the, parent feedback is everyone going to be happy if we start saying we are going to use not just examples that might be great for you know our upper middle class preschoolers but also for ones for kids who have been exposed to more adversity because that is perhaps from the research going to normalize things quite a bit so now everyone might have a little bit of a better chance to learn new concepts and build off of new concepts but the kids who had kind of come in with the advantage may not look like they have such an advantage um anymore and and they might not because they're not getting the ex the examples that are the most relevant to their own lives either so i, I don't know the the answer to that but it's uh, you know i i to me, I think it's a really important question. Um, and I would kind of turn that back around to both to you, Andrea, and also to the group. Like, what do you guys think should be, I mean, with the caveat that there aren't tons of studies like what I've shown you, right? So th there's the, the normal researcher caveat of we need more research, but um, what, what do you guys think? It gets me thinking about the uh, what are we measuring and for why? <laughs> what it, for what sake are we measuring this? Is, is is this the indicator of intelligence or academic achievement or growth that we're looking for? And I get once I start to get into that world, I, it's I feel like it's quite <laughs> and, yeah. well. And I I'd like to ask the question of what happens to those children that end up moving school to school to school to school to school because their, their environments are unstable? How do you maintain continuity when children have no stability and continuity on where they're getting their education from because they're being moved around? I think that's a great question. So that, that other group that I mentioned, um, Frankenhaus and Ellis, one of the exposures that they look at is specifically unpredictability and they find different results um, from that than they do to chronic you know, forms of adversity or, or neighborhood violence and actually different strengths too. But um, as far as I'm aware, their measure of unpredictability tends to be more with like stability in home life and not stability in in school. And I think, I, I don't know if you're thinking about, um, you know, the homeless population of, of or, children, or, sorry. Or, foster, or foster youth. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I, I think that that's, 
<laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if anyone else does, but I think it's really, um, because obviously those kids' lives are so complex too, right? Like, so, so I don't know if anyone has teased apart um, that bouncing around from one school to, to the next, but do you, have you, are you asking that because you have some research or some personal experience where you, you have a sense that that really matters to their educational yeah. journey? Yeah, so I'm an alumni of the foster care system and uh, working uh, on my undergraduate degree to actually uh, try and bring mental health into um, being a, a primary factor for all foster youth as they uh, go through, because it's important. And without that mental health component, the educational component is it's really tough to get them to engage. Mm -hmm. um, and it's inconsistent and it's inconsistent from one foster child to the next. My story is completely different from another foster alumni. Um, and this system, of course, is, you know, broken and the education system tries, um, but too many times uh, foster youth fall through the cracks. Um, in the midst of wonderful teachers trying their best, there's only so much resources available. Do you, do you think that, and this is maybe a very naive question, but do you think in addition to the mental health um, services that are probably in support that's needed, do you think that people are aware of the kind of that the unpredictability that would come with switching schools, that that could have um, an impact on brain development and cognitive functioning? Do you think that they just don't think about it? Or do you think it's just that there's no bandwidth to deal with that, that there's so many other issues to deal with as well? I think it's a combination of both, but definitely first and foremost, there's no bandwidth. There's not enough bandwidth to consider how do we keep this child in that same school? Um, and maybe with the same group of friends and with their siblings if possible, because there's that separation that, that happens as well. Um, and the first thing is to get the child safe, right? Into a safer environment, um, which of course is first and foremost, but then you, then you add on top of that, all the different changes in a new home and learning new you know, rules and ways to live in this new home, um, sibling or group homes, um, institutional um, places. And it's a lot that I, I really think it's not taken into consideration for these children um, in their advancement of their education. Like they're Yes, there are things we all need to learn multiplication, division, and you know, th those basic things. Yes, right. But they may be behind. And how do we help them navigate their education without feeling as though they are a minority in the education system? Yeah, I, 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 Monica, I'm not, I think those are really good good points. And again, if someone else um, also wants to respond, but I would say if you would like to email me separately, I'm thinking of a, a colleague actually in the San Francisco area who it might be um, nice for you uh, to, to speak with. And in so much that part of this is just awareness that this is even a problem, um, perhaps we could try to do something uh, about, about that. Um, the bandwidth for the foster care system is probably more than, you know, I, I don't think that I'm the right person to try to tackle <laughs> that. Yeah, that's, but that the, was a tough one. <laughs> but the awareness part, um, perhaps, and how it could link to th that some of these things are not just saying to kids like, oh, you know, toughen up, pull yourself up, but, but that there is actual differences yeah. um, going in that maybe well, I personally believe everything has, you know, we don't exist outside of our biology, but I know a lot of times for, for making a point to the public or to policymakers, when we bring in biology, it kind of underscores um, the, the need for, for certain types of programs and interventions. 
Yeah, I completely agree with that. I do really appreciate and like your point of maybe bringing the, the gap between um, students who are on the higher end and students that are on the lower end and really making the education um, con content more relevant across the board and trying to narrow that gap. I think that is ultimately probably the easiest um, starting point, maybe. And I think that's so interesting because when we think about so much of the research on early childhood, like bring in books that represent people's culture and like let students see themselves in the classroom. Um, and so little of that deals with some of the more adverse situations that you've talked about today. And like so little of those books really deal with uncertainty and, and violence. I understand like it's also important to understand, you know, that families look different and that we eat different food and that we have different holidays. And like obviously that is important. Um, but it's interesting to think about the fact that that like Monica was sharing about like the the instability of the foster care system, I don't see a lot of those kinds of books. I don't see a lot of like that connection happening in the classroom, especially for our younger students. Yeah, and I think part of that's right because we assume that that's not developmentally appropriate and it may not be a developmentally appropriate for some children, but it is the active experience of a lot of other kids. And I think there's also, you know, there's also literature out there that really questions. I mean, for me, when I look at insensitive care, now insensitive care is not, it's not the same as violence. It, 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 violence would be a form of insensitive care, but it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing as neglect, et cetera, et cetera. But when we think that close to 50% of the population, that is probably the predominant form of care they receive, right? And that's of low risk samples. To me, it really starts making me wonder, what is the normative experience? What is normative development? You know, is it really the the kids of other college professors who have come into the lab like or is there um a wider world out there that maybe experiences more adversity and what's developmentally appropriate for them maybe you know maybe different it also makes me think of um i was just teaching so i teach a class on assessment so we did the larry p um story in california and talked about how like um, there's still prohibitions on using uh, intelligence tests uh, for African-American children because those tests weren't normed and, and still aren't normed with African-American children. But then it's that same question. Well, what about the other groups that we know are going to have different responses? Um, and, and thinking about the disproportionate representation of different groups of children, including, for example, foster um, care youth in special education. Um, and how that might be related. Like, is it just that the, you know, whatever it is that we're testing is not capturing their strengths? Um, and then if they do need additional care, like what should that care look like? Is it special education or, or how would that, you know, what would benefit um, that community of children? Yeah, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Um, and, and I think the, this, the, you know, I didn't even touch on special education, um, which here gets called developmental needs. I don't know if that's a universal term or not. It's a funny term to me because I think that everyone, you know, all children have developmental needs. That's the point of being a child, right? Or a part and partial of being a child. But, um, but yeah, I was actually thinking about that last night that this work on adversity and strengths and stuff like that, you don't really see it in special needs groups, but it's not, um, it's not, it, it's sensical to think that some of the same processes would happen there as well. And I do know that um, the Frankenhaus group has cited a little bit of work with uh, with gifted children, actually. I, that might not be the special needs group that we're, we're talking about, but um, I, I haven't read the primary research on this, but their point was that um, gifted children also tend to benefit from kind of more concrete 
example. So while middle class children, their experience may be abstract concepts, a lot more of abstract concepts um, in their learning, even at home, but that um, gifted children really seem to learn best when the abstract concepts, when they understand the real world relevance for them. And so that this idea of teaching to personally relevant things may not just benefit the kids that we typically worry about, although I would argue if we were perhaps taking into account everyone's strengths, there might be fewer kids that we typically worry about, um, but also also benefit um, you know, other groups of children as well. So I, th I think it would be really cool to look at this um, in, in a special needs group. I've never worked with special needs kids. I'm not quite sure what the appropriate baseline tests would be and then to think about how to modify them. But I, I think that would be a very exciting um, area. I do want to acknowledge that a, a couple of us had to pop off a little earlier and they have uh, provided some feedback on your, your talk. So I wanted to point your attention that way and um, possibly give the remaining of us one last chance to ask a question. Can I ask a super basic, very quick question? Um, it seems like in, in a lot of these studies, we're dichotomizing between like sensitive and insensitive care, which I like, as obviously like that's a spectrum. Is there, do you have like a way we could think about, like way I could quickly think about like how much insensitive care gets me into the insensitive care group, if that makes sense. Right, so, um, so that is my fault because all of these studies I, I were actually run with continuous data, but um, for ease of discussion, I was talking about it that way. Um, but, but actually, so I've been, you know, in the attachment field since well before we met Robert, like, and it's actually taken me until this year to be like, you know what, it would really be good to have like some big published study that says this is how much insensitive care, uh, like this is the level that gets a cutoff because for, for most, and you know, not that I'm crazy about cutoffs, but like it, it would be useful to know, especially if you want to think about intervention, like when do we really need to start intervening with, with families? Um, I think from the few studies that look at kind of it in terms of a cutoff, and there are very, very few, uh, it's, it's to get into the sensitive group, you, you kind of have to be more sensitive than insensitive across a variety of different um, things and also not do anything really bad while we're observing <laughs> you. Um, so, but, uh, but in terms of guidelines, I mean, there are programs, there are interventions that kind of teach sensitive care. And a lot of that is treating the child as an individual, supporting them, eye contact, being responsive, understanding that they need you and love you and, and, and um, vice versa. But hopefully I've actually put it out to some, um, colleagues who are big on meta analyses and have lots and lots of attachment and sensitivity data. Um, so like kind of just last, last, within the last two months, I wrote to them and said, do you think that someone might want to do this at some point? Like <laughs> with the data that you, and they said, yeah, that's a great idea. So Robert, if only we could convince you to become an attachment researcher, the field would, you know, move forward with uh, leaps and bounds. Also, I should say, cause I know that that was, I think, um, I'm getting the sense our last, uh, perhaps our last question that I really appreciated all of the, the nice the nice comments and the feedback and really this wonderful opportunity um, to speak. And Emily, thank you so much for inviting me and, and um, organizing. And I, I hope to get to talk with your, your group again, especially if anyone had some interest in doing um, well, you know, just questions, but also doing some cross-cultural research with some of these ideas. Um, it would be really fun. Great. In fact, I think you, we already have colleagues in common. I saw you, do you publish with Purina Chung? Yes. 
she was yeah. a co-author of mine too. So oh, and Daniel, I'm sorry, that. we have overlapping worlds for sure. Oh, yeah. I should have invited that. I didn't invite any of my Singapore. Co- I, I, I invited a few people, but I tried to keep it to people who I thought would be in the same time zone. Uh, sure. Yeah. Karina's in the same center as I am, actually. I had no idea. I, I yeah. kind of lost touch with her. So that's great. I want to yeah. circle back. That would be super. Yeah, I'll let her know. Yeah. We've always, we've been toying around with a project that has data collection in Taiwan. And we've just been going all back and forth on it for many, many years. Okay. So I would love to close the loop with her again and touch base. Well, if you would like to come speak at our center, um, I think she may be one of the people who organizes the, the talks, actually. So. Oh. Great. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But well, I can also invite those, you. We can talk yeah. offline. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> How fun. Maria, it looked like you were going to say. I was, but I'm, I'll go ahead and send an email because it's, we're, I know we have to wrap up, but really enjoyed your presentation. So thanks so much for all your insights that you shared today. Oh, thank you. And please do, you know, if you, if, if you want to follow up, please do send me an, an email and I'll see uh, if I can answer or um, address anything. Yeah, thanks so much. Awesome. All right, well, I'll let you, everybody go. Monica, Nora, thank you for joining us. And Anne, it was lovely to meet you. And I think we have a lot to talk about. So I feel like let's not drag this conversation on, but we'll schedule another time to meet. And if you are in the area, I know that you have some plans to come to the area at some point. Uh, on it, they keep changing, but I will definitely um, let you know. And maybe I can even show up in person and listen to, if, if, if I'm allowed, listen to some of the other talks. Yeah. That'd be great. Take care. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for doing this, for helping us facilitate and everything. Don't be silly. Right. Thank you for putting this together. Bye, Have everyone. a good evening and Bye. morning. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.